Attention, please. Our train has arrived in Stanton on time. Standing in a depot, bustling with people, waiting in a ticket line. Hear that train a coming, hear that whistle blowing, going back down the tracks of time. Riding all along the farms and rivers, the railroad made these towns along the way. A way of life that's almost been forgotten, and it's a slow train to yesterday, and it's a slow train yesterday. Faster than fairies, faster than witches, bridges and houses, hedges and ditches, and charging along like troops in a battle, all through the meadows, the horses and cattle. All of the sights of the hill and the plain fly as thick as driving rain. And ever again, in the wink of an eye, painted stations whistle by. Here is a child who clambers and scrambles all by himself and gathering brambles. Here is the tramp who stands and gazes, and there is the green for stringing the daisies. Here is a cart run away in the road, lumping along with man and load. And here is a mill, and there is a river, each a glimpse and gone forever. Robert Louis Stevenson's poem, from a railway carriage certainly captures the fleeting existence of images seen by many railroad workers and passengers as trains rumble through the countryside. But are these memories really gone forever? Maybe, maybe not. Through the little towns and cities, Stanton and Clifton Forge, through the Shenandoah Valley countryside, the backyards of houses, the rolling fields and farmers, waving as the train passes by. The city council met last night, the vote was four to three, to tear the Home Depot down and build a factory, to take that strip of history and tear it off the map, to take old engine number nine and melt her into scrap. Now we have the highways and the airplanes. Progress always brings a faster way. For a little while, we're going back in time on a slow train yesterday. On a slow train yesterday. And I like it. It's hard. You get beat up a lot of times. You get cussed out. Everything, it's nothing easy. But Papa says, boy, when you got something easy, you never get nowhere. You got to have it hard. Like that, you're just like me, you got to have it hard. You got to live a hard life. That's what it is. That's what railroads is. It's a hard life. But it's a, it's a great life. It's a glorious life. It's, a, it's not a job, it's a legacy. That's what Papa says. <laughs> I've been working on the railroad all the live long day. More than any other industry, the railroad has captured the imagination and hearts of many Americans. But why? What accounts for this remarkably strong hold the railroad has had on American artists, songwriters, and poets? For many of us today, this image in love began on a Christmas morning with a small model train circling the living room floor, going through the same cardboard tunnel over and over again, but never quite losing its attraction. Nearly 150 years earlier, when railroading was in its infancy, similar images were indelibly inscribed on a nation by the Courier and Ives Prince. These iron horse lithographs were in nearly every home. In stark contrast, as more artists attempted to capture the nature of trains, Edward Hopper's paintings visited deserted tracks with lonely towers and depots without passengers or workers. 
His still railroad cars with isolated passengers seem to say, yes, you can travel, but loneliness may be your only companion. Much of his work is an effort to come to terms with the fears generated by this new technology. In many minds, though, the idea of the railroad has always meant escape and freedom. And at no time in American history did this idea take on more social significance than when prior to the Civil War, the escape route for slaves was dubbed the Underground Railroad. Harriet Tubman was the most daring and successful conductor. She made 19 trips into the South, bringing 300 friends, relatives, and strangers to freedom. She was, in a poet's words, the last faint tremor of hope upon the wind. She was Harriet Tubman, who never run her train off the track and never lost a passenger. The Civil War was the first war in which railroads played a decisive role. The railways were the supreme symbol of the gap between the North and the South. The South, the agricultural South, had developed very few railroads and very few connecting railroads. The North more or less developed standard gauge of four feet, eight and a half inches, and the railroads were largely connected. And of course, there were many more of them since the North was a largely industrial, urbanizing area, whereas the South was not. And these two factors were important in the outcome of the war. Within 18 months, the Union had organized its railways on an integrated war footing, and this superior rail strength helped defeat the South. In 1859, at the age of 12, this young newspaper boy on the Grand Trunk Railroad in Maine was to become, perhaps, the most influential man of the 19th and 20th centuries. His name is Thomas Alva Edison. His profession? Inventor. And later, he'd be known as the Wizard of Menlo Park. The 20th century will often be remembered for the railroad and the movies, separately and together. This association began in 1903 with Edison's first movie, The Great Train Robbery, which was produced to demonstrate his newest invention, the movie camera. This film created a sensation when it flickered before its astonished audiences. It left the viewers with a feeling that they had actually witnessed a genuine robbery of a real train. The history of the United States, Virginia, and railroad companies have always been dependent upon exploration, surveying, and mapping, especially so when the continent was linked by the Union Pacific and Central Pacific in 1869 at Promontory Point in Utah. This is your stewardess. I thought you might like to know that we're about to pass Harper's Ferry. Harper's Ferry, scene of John Brown's raid and of other stirring events of Civil War days. The Baltimore and Ohio was in the thick of it. In Virginia, records show that in 1836, the Winchester and Potomac Railroad was the first line up the valley and ran from Harper's Ferry to Winchester and later to Strasburg. This line was purchased in 1899 by the B&O, which had already built in the 1870s the Valley Railroad which would eventually run south to Lexington. The Manassas Gap Railroad, an extension of the Orange and Alexandria Railroad, was the first to cross the Blue Ridge Mountains. It was completed in 1854 to join Strasburg with the upper Piedmont Basin. The Chesapeake and Ohio began in 1836 as the Louisa Railroad, running from Richmond to Louisa County. It changed its name to the Virginia Central in 1850 and reached Waynesboro and Stanton in 1854. In 1868, with thoughts of westward expansion, it changed its name to the C&O. In 1972, the C&O merged with the B&O and Western Maryland to form the Chessie System. And in 1982, the Chessie System merged with Seaboard System to form CSX Transportation. 
The history of the Norfolk Southern Corporation is one of numerous mergers. In 1881, after several mergers, one ambitious railroad was the Norfolk and Western Railway, which was to run west from Norfolk through Roanoke into the nearby coal fields. Soon thereafter, it was consolidated with the Shenandoah Valley Railroad, which ran north-south through towns like Solitude, Elkton, and Grottoes. It kept the NNW name. Much later, in 1959, the NNW, a prime coal hauler, merged with another coal line, the Virginian Railway, which also ran from Norfolk to the coal fields of West Virginia. And in 1982, Norfolk Southern was formed with the consolidation of Norfolk and Western and Southern Railway. When anyone hears a train whistle blow, the first image thought is the locomotive. Not merely an enormous machine, but a symbol of freedom, beauty, and power. Roanoke became Roanoke because of the Norfolk and Western Railroad. In the 1880s, this, this little place where, this big place where we are right now was, was called Big Lick. And at the time, it's a great story because at the time, um, they heard, the, the fathers here heard that a railroad was looking for a location. Salem um, was a place that they were looking for, but Big Lick said, heck no, come to us. So they had a town meeting, they got together, and they said, let's put our money where our mouth is. Did sort of a Paul Revere ride to Baltimore where, where this railroad was organizing and said, look, all of us have signed this petition. We've uh, committed a certain amount of money to bring you down here. Come and see us. Come locate with us. Well, sure enough, this organizing railroad did that. They came to, to Big Lick and they said, whoa, great area. We love this. And in two years, Roanoke was created. Big Lick and a neighboring town called Old Lick got their names from nearby salt deposits. The famous midnight ride was to Lexington, Virginia in 1881, and the response was immediate. The railroad would commit to Big Lick. The two cities merged in 1882 and changed their names to Roanoke after the river and county. In 1883, the Norfolk and Western moved its headquarters into Roanoke and then established the Roanoke shops. This steam engine, Locomotive 117, was built in 1884 and was the first of hundreds that would follow. This facility was billed as the greatest car and locomotive manufacturing plant in the South. And into the 20th century, any traveler passing through Roanoke sensed this. Locomotives built in Roanoke were known almost worldwide. They were designed by the Norfolk and Western's own mechanical department. They were assembled and fabricated right in the, in the shops, and they were homegrown products, but they were unsurpassed in the field of railroad steam motive power. And I thought, this is a place I would like to come back to someday. Louis Newton literally has the railroad in his blood. His grandfather worked as a railroad mail clerk, and his father was a foreman on the Mobile Light and Railroad Company. As a child, you could sense what his career might be. And after 37 years of service with the NNW, he still remembers those three years he worked in the shops as a special apprentice. And a new engine would roll out of the shop, and the company had such confidence in the quality of work done in the shop that an engine would go out of the shop and without any breaking in would get on a train and go down the road with it. And I thought that was a remarkable feat. Building locomotives of its own design at the company's Roanoke shops, the NNW designed a class of locomotives known as the modern coal-burning steam locomotives, which comprised three separate classes. The A, with its unique wheel configuration, could easily move long coal and freight trains over flat areas of the Norfolk and Western's routes. The J was a streamlined passenger engine capable of traveling 15,000 miles a month at up to 110 miles an hour. 
and the Y6 was the workhorse of the railroad, packing a heavy punch for mountain grades and curvature of the coal field branch lines. The precise design, detailed craftsmanship, and conscientious operation of these engines had their effect, and not just in Virginia. But the steam locomotive had the capacity to carry tremendous burdens, whether it be huge amounts of people or huge burdens of, of materials, of raw materials, of, of finished goods. The steam locomotive could travel fast over a good roadbed, and therefore distances were shrunk. Tra the distance that used to, to take uh, months was now shrunk to weeks. The distances that took weeks to travel were shrunk to days, and those that took days to hours. And, and the shrinking of the world that, that we talk so much about today began then, and it was the steam locomotive, always at the vortex, always at the center uh, of, of the railroad, and the railroad always at the center of life in America, really. In Roanoke today, this history is being preserved at the Virginia Museum of Transportation, where rail fans can stroll among the rolling stock of Virginia's railroads. Each summer, the museum sponsors a railway festival where railroaders and fans gather to reminisce, shop, and enjoy special presentations like the Buckingham Lining Bar Gang. The gang is retired railroad workers sponsored by the Virginia Foundation for the Humanities and the Norfolk Southern Foundation. Songs were crucial in coordinating their efforts, and it made the day go just a little quicker. Wirt Johnson worked for the CNO line for 40 years. By singing all those songs, funny like that, it cheered everybody. Everybody was sweating, but it cheered up to hear a new song and, and kept something jolly amongst the men. And we got along all right in the evening, even after we quit work, we would always saying something funny of us, telling, telling, telling jokes or what not, you know, and all such as that. And I would make up a new rhyme for the next month, next day. What you got? I said, I'll tell you when you get on the line ball gang the next day. And, do, and so we did that for a year. I did that for 26 years. Hard breaking back work. Life as a railroad worker has never been easy, as you can see in these Norfolk and Western archival photographs. Group portraits of this era have frozen in time the machinists, foundry workers, and laborers who were employed by the railroad. At this railway festival is a photographer who spent over five years in Western Virginia capturing the last days of steam with his lens. The first time I ever saw an O. Winston Link, I had never heard the man's name. I saw it was the one that I think is the absolute epitome of 50s. It's the one in the drive-in with the old jet plane on the screen and a steam engine in the background with a couple in the convertible. That just screamed Americana 50s. I had never seen a picture like this, but I could see what was there and I could see what I could do and what had to be done. And when I developed the film, it's exactly what I wanted, even the density and the negatives and everything. I could see all of that. In 1955, while on a commercial assignment in Stanton, Winston Link decided to take some pictures of NW's train number two in Waynesboro. Pleased with the results, he requested permission and assistance from the Norfolk and Western which was soon granted after seeing his work. At this point, he committed himself to creating a complete document of steam railroading as it slowly chugged its way into history. This included not only the locomotives, but life along the tracks. Link's equipment usually included two or three four by five graphic view cameras with a number of lenses and plenty of film. A trailer was needed to transport the special reflectors when shooting at night, which was his preferred time. Because by shooting at night, you could control the light and compose the picture with, as far as lighting and the subject matter any way that you wanted it. It was just infinite what you could do. Daytime, you're so, where's the sun? The sun over here is in the east or in the west, it's in the wrong place. And uh, the pictures didn't glisten. There just weren't any, there was nothing. There's so many pictures are, are zeros. 
But at night you can control it and make a masterpiece. In the daytime you can't do that very well. There were a few notable exceptions to the nighttime black and whites. Link especially enjoyed Southwest Virginia in autumn. One of the greatest pictures of all was a color shot of the uh, high ball for the double header. The China has a water sign in it. But that has that doesn't have much color except for the red lantern I put in the window to the shot. It was a horrible night. But uh, there was enough color in it to hold it, and it's beautiful. That's one of my favorites, that one. O. Winston Link spent five years recording life along the steam railroad as though it would exist forever, and in his photos, it does. Yeah, I love, I love this country. I especially love the railroad. Everything about it, everything about the railroad. Everything I had, had water tanks and crossings and crossing gates and whistles and bells and steam. And I had so many things about it and it smells to it and the people are nice. Yes, the Iron Horse is coming, and that's good news. It will cure hard times and drive away the blues. Awake from your slumber, ye you good mountaineers, you'll hear the mighty whistle in two or three years. Clifton Forge known as Williamson Station in 1857 when the railroad arrived, really owes its development to those black diamonds that were being mined in West Virginia. On the CNO, they needed a facility that was located somewhere just east of the Allegheny Mountains because the coal was hauled from West Virginia across the Alleghenies and thence down the James River to the eastern seaboard. So they needed a location where there could be an exchange of heavy locomotives to lighter locomotives as the trains came in from the west and Clifton Forge was sited at that location for that particular reason. Coal, during the early 1900s, was still the main source of energy in all industrial countries. And about half of all U.S. coal reserves lie in the eastern half of the nation, with West Virginia at the center of this bonanza. West Virginia, oh, my home. West Virginia. On this eastbound CSXT coal train out of Hinton, West Virginia, bound for Clifton Forge and then on to an East Coast pier, Archie Phipps is our engineer and Glenna Prinsback is our conductor, both with over 15 years experience. When pulling so many coal cars in rainy weather, Archie is constantly alert for anything unusual. You get your right amount of air at the top of the hill, keep your speed down, it's not too bad. Uh, you got, like today, we got 22,000 tons behind us. You got to really get your air right. Uh, if you get too much, you hang up. Your brakes come on your train too much. If you don't get enough, you don't get enough brakes on your wheels, and you tend to want to uh, go faster than what you want. Just luckily today, we got her pretty good. We're doing all right. There's a mystique about this train and its friendly crew as it winds its way out of the mountains. As this 200-ton, 4,000-horsepower diesel locomotive comes within sight of the Clifton Forge refueling station, you can almost feel history repeating itself. Since 1889, when the C&O Railway decided to build a large repair shop and yard, the tracks would be lined with coal cars waiting to be coupled up and sent on their way. The center of the town was really the YMCA on the right, and the new Gladys Inn Hotel on the left, both built in the mid-1890s. The YMCA, a superb example of Victorian architecture, was built to provide all of the railroad men with a place to eat, sleep, relax, and stay out of trouble. The work was hard and dirty, but it provided a decent wage, and all able-bodied men were hired to work on the tracks and in the shops and roundhouse servicing the locomotives. I wish they had steam engines now. Everybody had a job. 
That's the only difference. See. Abraham Thompson started working for the railroad in 1925 when he was 15 years old. Of course, I worked in the diesel shop for six years. You see, and of course, I like the diesel all right, but I like that steam. That's a, my job was <clears throat> my job was hard, but I liked it. Yes, sir, I worked up there a long time. Working on the section gang was usually how most young men began working for the railroad, and it was hard work. Retired CNO fireman Woody Vess recalls both the pain and his father's advice. Boy, I was making that big money at 35 cents an hour. It looked good to me. <laughs> and they, but my back hurt me, but I just, Papa said, boy, you got to keep going. You, you can't give up now. So I just kept it going, kept it going. And this foreman's would come, come around and holler at you. I said, what's wrong, boy? You straighten up, get your breath. Do you feel a little bad? I said, no, I don't feel. Well, I, well, you know something? You better get to work, or if you don't, you're going to feel bad. I'm going to make you feel bad. You like that? I said, yes, sir. And I went back to work. Directly across from the Amtrak station is the CNO Museum, which houses not only a gift shop, business office, and library, but a full time archivist. Margaret Anderson works upstairs researching, cataloging, and sometimes gluing in an effort to preserve the history of the CNO. This is a calendar, an old Chessy calendar that's going to be used in the exhibit next summer um, over here at our Allegheny Arts and Crafts Center. And um, this, cal this calendar suffered some damage over the years, and so I'm trying to put it back together, a little conservation work. In 1933, the CNO adopted this sleepy little kitten for use in an ad campaign and called her Chessie, short for Chesapeake. She was instantly an unqualified success and soon appeared on calendars and in ads for the next 40 years. Chessie became one of America's most beloved corporate symbols, and she's as popular today as she was back in the 1930s. Chessie was very well known but what wasn't well publicized was the role of women working for the railroad. The numbers have always been small, but those that were employed served in indispensable positions. It certainly has always been a man's world. There have been women um, dispatchers. I have photographs of railroad offices, women working in the offices. Um, the CNO Hospital and Nursing School was a very important entity here in Clifton Forge. From 1896 to 1916, the CNO Hospital for Employees was housed in the First Gladys Inn Hotel. The School of Nursing was organized in 1916, and in the following year, the entire school and staff moved into a new 65-bed hospital. Dr. Charles F. Ballou III began working there in 1959. The CNO Hospital had a very unique arrangement. First of all, all an employee had to do was show up and say, I'm here for a checkup and be admitted. People would, at 10 o'clock in the evening, the train from the east and the, west, and the one later from the west would disgorge people from employees as far as away from Lake Michigan or from the Tidewater coming up here. Sometimes a man and a wife would show up and come up, we're here for our checkup, they'd be admitted there for a couple of days, have a checkup, and they'd be on their way. The place was always full and there was always plenty of work to do because of that. In 1971, the hospital changed its name to the Emmett Memorial Hospital in honor of longtime chief surgeon Dr. J. M. Emmett. In 1972, the CNO School of Nursing closed, and Emmett Memorial was replaced by a hospital in Low Moor, Virginia, in 1979. It seems that in the past, and I can't really give you a date for when this changed, at some point through mergers, I guess. Um, the workers used to feel that the CNO was their family, that it would always be there. It took care of them as they took care of it. They were conscientious workers. They devoted their life to that railroad. And today, that feeling is gone. A conductor was once described by a British visitor as half clerk, half guard with a dash of gentleman. He is generally well-dressed, sometimes with a beard, and when off-duty, he passes for a respectable personage at any of the hotels. 
except for the beard. This is a pretty accurate description of conductor Wayne Martin on the Amtrak train, the Cardinal. Stay behind the line. Have your tickets ready. Price the voice of the conductor. He's a well-mannered man, as you can see. He's the man in charge of the safety of this train. Don't you doubt his authority. No, ma'am. This train is not going. This train came from Chicago. Okay. We're going to Washington, D.C. Good. I'm required to watch both ways until we get moving to make sure nobody's hanging on the side of the train. Take care now. Wayne has been working on the railroad for 30 years. First as a brakeman with the CNO Railway in Clifton Forge, and later as a conductor with the Chessie system and now CSX Transportation. Because of his time with CSXT, he remains their employee, even though he's now a full-time conductor on Amtrak. The difference between a, being a uh, pastor train conductor over freight trains is that you're dealing with people more. Uh, we have contact all the time with the passengers and we we have to uh, make a station stops, we have to sell the tickets, we have to seat the people on board, we have to see to their every complaint. This train runs from Chicago to Washington DC and returns. Wayne's run is between Clifton Forge and Washington but it passes through Craigsville, where he lives with his wife, Judy, and their children. I always try to wait, wave my wife when I come through Craigsville. My house is right here. There she is. We can stand on our back porch and, and wave at Wayne when he goes through. And at Christmas time, when we decorate, we decorate the front of the house for the community, the back of the house for the train. So, you know, it, it's amazing and it's actually fun, really, to watch a train come through because you get on there and people staring at you. What them fools doing? We're waving at the train. We know the conductor. You folks enjoying yourself? Yeah. Great. Glad to have you on board. Are you lost? Yeah, I see you got the map. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah. She, she's not too sure. She questions my directions all the time. You trying I'm, to find out where you are? No, I know where we're at. We, we, we're going through Crossit right here. Yeah. Where? Crossit. Crozet. 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 <laughs> Crozet. <laughs> right. That, uh, the town is named after uh, a gentleman who uh, dug the Blue Ridge Mountain Tunnel. The new Blue Ridge Tunnel, one mile long, runs just below Claudius Crozet's original tunnel. Yeah, we were in a long time. Y'all yep. enjoying your ride? Mm -hmm. yeah. That's great. I'm back and ride with us again. After passing Craigsville and stopping in Stanton, the train continues on to Charlottesville and then to Washington, where Wayne will get off and drive his car back to Craigsville until the next train, two days from now. It seemed like we were kind of a different breed of people. I found out after I was there for a while that it, got, it gets into your blood. It's kind of like being like sawdust in a circus man. The railroad gets into your blood, and once it's in there, it, you just can't quit. You, you have that, what we call romance of the rails. In the last 150 years throughout the world, the railroad depot has been the scene of more greetings and farewells than any other public place. But few were... In practically every American town, from the largest urban station to the most obscure water stop, the railroad depot was the focus of activity and local pride. Railroad companies, influential and profitable, knew this and in many cases spared no expense in design and architecture to attract attention and customers to the site. At the same time, especially in small country towns in agricultural states like Virginia, the local depot was usually planned by the engineering department of the railroad and built by the company's carpenters. But this was not the case with the CNO station in Stanton. 
The main passenger terminal was designed in an unusual adaptation of the bungalow style by local architect T.J. Collins, who had moved to Stanton in 1891, and in the next 20 years, designed or renovated over 200 buildings in Augusta County. Nearly 100 years later, the depot is still a site for locals to gather and enjoy themselves due to the effort of one man, Vic Minert. Trains have always played an incredible role in history, both in terms of passenger travel and enjoyment and commerce. And uh, uh, now people can, can come to a train station like this. They can stand at the wrought iron fences. They can, they can walk the, the, uh, the platforms down in front of the freight office. They can look up at the water tower. They can see the, the actual locomotive water filling spout that was there. And uh, stations like this uh, take, give people a chance to see what it used to be like in, in the heyday, in the, in, the, in the grand old days of railroad travel. Over the years, the station had fallen into serious disrepair. But when Vic and his family moved here from Atlanta in 1986, he knew the building was sound. Architecture is history. It expresses history. It expresses times gone by. And when you walk into the stability and, and the, the the very size and, and the structure and the, the heft of a railroad station, you realize the strength that this country had during those days. The railroad was a part of that strength. The buildings expressed that strength. The CNO station, which is still an active Amtrak depot, now includes shops and turn of the century restaurants, an old fashioned ice cream parlor complete with soda fountain, and a grill with one of the longest Victorian bars in the country. Of course, the cabooses sit idle, just outside the bay windows. To me, to have been involved in a project that has such emotional appeal, and as well as such historic significance, has been uh, the highlight of my entire career. It's been most rewarding. I've enjoyed it, and I'm, I'm thankful to have had the opportunity to do that in Stanton, to have been part of something that means so much to the community. was apple blossom time in old Virginia, in the valley of the Shenandoah. In Winchester, apples and railroads just seem to go together wherever you are, and especially at the annual Apple Blossom Festival. In 1925, at the second festival, local railroads offered discount rates to all people attending the event. And later, the B&O operated a 15-car Apple Blossom special that brought a thousand people to the festival from Baltimore and Washington. Winchester has been served by three different railroad lines. The Winchester and Western, the Cumberland Valley, which was later purchased by the Pennsylvania Railroad, and the B&O, with its main depot located near historic downtown Winchester. The railroad, to me, uh, means heritage. It's how this country was founded. Um, the railroad was a, a strong economic, the, the pinnacle of success, you might say, in its day. Uh, the depot brings a touch of that nostalgia back to the town. And knowing that if, it becomes, if it's restored as a historic building, that it will be one of those things that will help keep us aware of our past and also be providing a service um, in the future. The B&O station was constructed in the late 1800s and is listed on the National Register of Historic Places. Even in its current decayed condition, its design can still be appreciated. The dominant feature is the high-pitched slate roof with decorative tower, cupola, turrets, and cones. Preliminary efforts to renovate the depot are just about complete. CSX Transportation uses the downstairs as office space, and the upstairs is occupied by the Winchester and Western Railroad. Not long ago, John Hood was the business manager of the Winchester and Western, and is a certified locomotive engineer. He remembers what it was like growing up near the tracks. There's something about a great, huge iron monster chugging down a track on a cold day when you're not looking at smoke, but you see building clouds of white steam that just seems to say, all's right with the world. And no matter what the weather, no matter what the politics, no matter what the peace or war situation, there's going to be a train. Anytime a wheel turns on a railroad, somebody somewhere is thinking, choo, choo, choo. Woo, woo. oh man, were those the good old days. Chug, chug, chug. 
chug, puff, puff, chug, chug went the little blue engine. I think I can, I think I can, I think I can, I think I can. Listen, honey, I think I hear a train coming. Trains have run through this farm for nearly 150 years. It's near the town of Swope, just west of Stanton, Virginia. Except for 12 years in Richmond, Robert Brown has lived and farmed here all his life. Every day, rain or shine, you can see Robert and his oldest son, Robbie, doing the daily chores. Once in a while, Nan, Robert's wife, will venture out to relay a message or bring some iced tea. There's little doubt that this is a small family farm. Robert and Nan moved into the new house in 1956. In addition to raising five children, Nan was a teacher at the Virginia School for the Deaf and Blind for 23 years. Sometimes, while in the kitchen preparing dinner, she often recollects the train, her five children, and many, many dinners. When the children were little, I remember sitting at the um, kitchen table so many times and they'd hear the train come and it wasn't always a whistle. It, they didn't always blow the whistle, but you'd hear the rumble, especially in the cold winter weather. You could hear it way off coming. And uh, the children would always jump up and say, oh, they'd try to guess first if it was a freight or a passenger, you know. <laughs> and so that was a game they played, you know, all the time when they were little. Is it a freight or a passenger? You know, and then they'd guess and they'd look see what it was and then they would say I won or I knew what it was but it, it's it's very much a part of our lives it really is over the years mr. Brown has heard just about every train story and he knows that you can expect a train to rumble by any time day or night and when it does you can feel the ground tremble even when on the second floor of the old house One time, my grandmother, this was back in 1935, I believe, was staying with us, and at night, and she told us the next morning that we had had an earthquake. And I'm sure, sure it was a train, and she felt the bed shaking, and she thought it was an earthquake. Robbie has grown up with the railroad literally in his backyard and sees both the creative and the practical advantages of living this close to a photographer's dream and a farmer's nightmare. His pictures seem to capture both the serenity and the power of the railroad. Being interested in images, uh, stopping action, um, I think seeing the trains come through the woods on a rainy or snowy night uh, has always fascinated me. And I, I don't know that you could say that that's a positive aspect of the railroad in, in a practical sense. I'm sure it, it is not, but um, uh, I've always thought that that was a very beautiful sight. And uh, uh, certainly, I guess, one of the worst <laughs> examples I can think of is something like the train hitting our neighbor's cattle, because we always worry that it could happen to us, and, which it could easily. We try to be very careful. Uh, but, you know, there's always the possibility that that could happen. The train always brings something with it. Sometimes the threat of danger, sometimes a vision of beauty. But it always brings with it an air of excitement, even if you've lived next door to it for 40 or 50 years. We always think about it when there's company, because uh, no matter how many years it's been since they've been here, a lot of people come back. We had a family reunion. And it was so neat to see everybody, you know, sitting here and then the train came. Oh, the train's coming through. We got to go watch it, you know. Still, these 70-year-old people 
who are still so excited when they hear the train coming through. And that's what it does to people. And, and I guess I have gotten to the point now where I, you know, pretty much take for granted the sounds that it makes and uh, just knowing that it's going through until somebody comes. And I think, yeah, it is really special, you know, to have that train going through here. Here's the engineer, a fine citizen, a man who owns his own home and sends his boys and girls to college. He's able, cool-headed, resourceful, and experienced. You got to know what you can do. You got to know when you go do it. You ain't got time to think. You got to know. I would not marry a blacksmith. He's always in the black. But I would marry an engineer who pulls the throttle back. A railroader mother, a railroader, a railroader for me. If ever I marry in all my life, a railroader's bride I'll be. Well. When you go, when we leave Harrisburg in the morning, we see the sun. We see the sun come up. Nobody has, has not, never been on a train and looking out over the mat, over the hills in the woods and see a sunrise or a sunset. It, it, words just don't express it. It lets you know that there's got to be a higher power somewhere than us. Lowell Wright has been working for the Chesapeake Western Railway for nearly 30 years. The last 10 as an engineer. The CW Railway is now owned by the Norfolk Southern Corporation, and this 5 a.m. freight train makes a daily run from Harrisonburg to Mount Jackson, Virginia, and returns. And I never dreamed, when I, when I went to work for the railroad, I never dreamed of being an engineer, didn't, I didn't think it would ever come, but it did. Peering through the fog and storm when the airplanes are grounded and the trucks and motor cars are stalled in snow drifts, He's the man who drives every day in the year, no matter what the anything. He has to fight the road hogs at the crossings and dodge the nitwits who want to race the train. My biggest concern on them crossings is a gasoline trailer or a school bus. I think about it every day, but you can't let it dwell on your mind, because if you did, you'd lose your mind. If anyone truly enjoys his job, it's Lowell. And he's been through just about every kind of weather possible. Although it's early October, he knows that winter is just around the bend. Best thing about being an engineer and working for the railroad, I don't have to worry about being out in the weather. That's the one thing I think about all, all winter long. I reckon I just consider my luck and thank the good Lord above it. I don't have to worry about the weather. I got to worry about the weather getting back and forth to work, but once I get here, I don't have to worry about it no more. Lowell began with the Chesapeake Western straightening track, then brakeman and conductor. He remembers clearly when things weren't so formal or predictable. Well, I have known the section men to have to go along and straddle the rail and pull the grass away from the inside the rail in order for us to get up and down the hill. That's, that's where the name come crooked and weedy. The real, uh, Chesapeake Western, they weren't ashamed of it because that's what went by. They said, you work for the crooked and weedy, that's where we were at. The history of the Chesapeake Western was informally documented by ex-employee C. Grattan Price, Jr. in his book, The Crooked and Weedy. What I can say about Crooked and Weedy, which that's what Mr. Grattan Price's book is named, Crooked and Weedy, uh, it, lives, it lives up to his name. All it is is crooked curves and weedy. As the train approaches the turnaround point, it's an incredibly beautiful morning, and Lowell has a lot to be grateful for. A good job, a loving family, and one hell of a locomotive. Well, when you, when you, when you got a heavy train and you pull that throttle back, and you know what you know the horsepower you got. Is old is I tell them sometimes that I got enough uh, I got enough power to pull Harrisburg off a map and get a chain around it. And you can do it.
In the summer of 1996, Strasburg, Virginia celebrated the opening of its newest museum, and it was quite a celebration. I'm glad that the town of Strasburg participated in and helped acquire the grants for the rebuilding and the reopening of this museum. Ready? Exhibits inside the museum are 18th and 19th century articles in authentic condition, with a special area for the history of the railroad. The building, built in 1891, was originally a steam pottery. But in 1913, the Southern Railway began to use it as a passenger and freight depot. At the height of this activity, about 85 men were employed by the railroad. Strasburg Mayor Harry Applegate wears his engineer's hat daily in respect for these men. The railroads have meant more to me than I can begin to describe when you think about the part that it had in the history of this great United States when it brought the east to the west and the west to the east and opened up vast farmlands, vast timberlands, vast mineral resorts. And when I say mineral, I'm thinking about the oil that was transported by tankers and such as that. I think economically that it has been a real boon for the country. As part of this celebration, Tony Coogan conducts horse-drawn tours of the city on his Manassas Gap railroad wagon. Besides being a tour guide, Tony has another occupation which may directly affect the future of the valley. And uh, what, what I do, I'm the director of the Shenandoah Rail Initiative. You may have read that in the newspaper. And what we're trying to do is we're trying to bring locomotive service back into the valley for passengers. And the, the marketing ploy that we want to use is we have all these battlefields in the valley. And it's very interesting that most of these battlefields share a common resource, the rail resource. This effort to link historic sites in the valley by rail is a monumental task. But if he does get permission to use the tracks, he will then need a vintage steam train. Fortunately, he knows where one is, in Stanton, Virginia, under wraps, and just waiting to be brought back to life. They've approached us about being the operator if they acquire the railroad, which we have tentatively agreed to in view of the fact that this probably wasn't going to work. And if they acquire the railroad up there or get access to it in some fashion, or they lease, buy it, purchase, whatever, chances are we're going to move up there. Jack Showalter is the chief mechanical officer of the Virginia Central Railroad, and his daughter Sally is the owner. This excursion train ran a 10-day trial season from Charlottesville to Clifton Forge in 1993. But since then, negotiations to acquire track rights have bogged down, primarily due to insurance coverage. Well, it hurts. They need to be running, and I need to be running them. I don't have but a couple more years left, and uh, if these engines leave here, I dare say that none will ever return to Virginia. And it's sad. You'd be surprised that the little people come here. I'm talking about two and three and four years old. Have an incredible fascination with a choo-choo train. Looks like it ought to be somewhere that uh, one of them could be preserved and running. I don't think it's asking a whole lot. It's ironic and somewhat chilling that the scrapyard is only a few yards away, seemingly waiting for this little bit of history. It's simply a beautiful train. And it may, if luck is on its side, transport its passengers back in time. It really could be a slow train to yesterday. Peanuts sitting on a railroad track is hard as all a flutter. Down the line comes engine nine. Peanut butter. Oh, cranberries sitting on the railroad track, feeling mean and cross. Down the line comes engine nine. Cranberry sauce, 
Oh, Apple sitting on a railroad track, keeping his eye on a spider. Down the line comes engine nine. Apple cider. Oh, it ain't going to rain no more, no more. It ain't going to rain no more. Now, how in the heck can you wash your neck if it ain't going to rain no more? If it ain't a going to rain no more. I blow a whistle like a freight train. You do? Yay. Yeah. <laughs>